Okay, uh, good afternoon. I am uh, Nirman Vimalaratna, uh, one of the clinical fellows in endocrinology. Uh, today, my uh, presentation is based on hypophysitis, uh, which is a, uh, a growing spectrum of rare pituitary disease. Uh, so uh, this uh, presentation is mainly based on this mini review uh, uh, on JCEM recently published uh, on January 2022. So uh, basically they have done a, a PubMed online database search on relevant topics. Uh, in June 2021, and the articles were screened by title and abstract and restricted to adults. And the references uh, from selected articles were also reviewed, and preferably uh, last five to 10 years were uh, uh, reviewed uh, mainly. So the definition is uh, inflammation of the pituitary gland that is primary or secondary to a local or systemic process. And uh, according to the anatomical distribution, it is a uh, classified as uh, adenohypophysitis, where uh, the anterior pituitary is mainly affected, uh, infundibular neurohypophysitis, where the infundibulum and the posterior pituitary is affected, and uh, panhypopituitarism, where uh, the entire pituitary is affected, and in rarely only uh, isolated hypothalamitis. So uh, this diagram illustrates uh, the anatomical distribution of uh, hypophysitis. Uh, where you can see uh, this uh, an, uh, adenohypophysitis, uh, sorry, uh, or uh, infundibular hypophysitis or panhypophysitis. So uh, the reported prevalence is um, estimated to be one in uh, seven to nine million. And, uh, but in recent past, it has been uh, increased due to recognition of novel causes increased use of uh, and sophistication of imaging and increased number of pathological uh, samples in post pituitary surgery. So uh, the etiology is broadly uh, classified as primary or secondary. And in primary hypophysitis, uh, there's isolated uh, pituitary involvement due to autoimmune conditions, inflammatory or infiltrative conditions. And in secondary hypophysitis, uh, it can develop as a reaction to a local process, for example, a rupture of Rathke's clepsis, or systemic disease, infection, neoplastic process, or drugs. So uh, this uh, uh, chart illustrates the uh, uh, common uh, secondary etiologies. As we all know, in the recent past, we have come across a uh, few patients with uh, autoimmune checkpoint inhibitor-induced uh, uh, hypophysitis, as well as autoimmune conditions, connective tissue disorders, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, sarcoidosis, and uh, infiltrative other infiltrative uh, diseases like Langerhans cell histiocytosis, IgG4 uh, related disease, vasculitis, infection, and paraneoplastic syndromes have been encountered as secondary causes. In uh, paraneoplastic syndromes, uh, it's an antibody mediated process uh, where um, uh, uh, thymomas and large cell neuroendocrine uh, uh, tumors have been identified. So um, this classification is mainly based on the histopathological uh, variations of uh, hypophysitis. And uh, lymphocytic uh, hypophysitis is the main um, variation of hypophysitis, and it can be uh, primary or secondary. And as we all know, the primary occurs mainly in females during their reproductive age, especially during the third trimester of pregnancy or peripartum period. And uh, it will coexist with autoimmunity as well. Uh, so they usually present with anterior hypopituitarism, and uh, there can be rarely DI uh, association as well. So the MRI is usually homogeneously enhancing gland. Uh, with uh, stock thickening and later stage, they can present with empty cell syndrome. So granulomatous uh, hypophysitis is another variation, much severe than uh, lymphocytic hypophysitis. And uh, xanthogranulomatous hypophysitis uh, mainly occur as a secondary uh, hypophysitis uh, due to hemorrhage or rupture of Rathke's clepsis, craniopharyngeomia, or other uh, systemic autoimmune disorders. Necrotizing hypophysitis is a rare uh, disorder. And IgG4-related condition, immunotherapy-induced uh, hypophysitis and other autoimmune uh, hypophysitis, mainly as a paraneoplastic uh, hypophysitis variations have been identified. So uh, the differential diagnosis, uh, mainly essentially 
axilla and para axilla tumors like craniopharyngiomas, germinomas, and astrocytomas uh, can mimic uh, hypophysitis, as well as uh, physiological uh, pituitary hypertrophy, uh, especially untreated uh, hypothyroidism, uh, uh, lactotroph hypertrophy in uh, lactation, and uh, uh, puberty, uh, they can mimic hypophysitis changes, as well as metastatic uh, deposits, uh, pituitary apoplexy, lymphoproliferative malignancies, and acute Sheehan syndrome can mimic hypophysitis. Uh, the classical presentation is with symptoms related to pituitary deficiencies with or without headaches and vision changes related to the mass effect. Approximately 50% of patients with uh, uh, primary hypophysitis present with headaches, while 10 to 30 percent present with visual disturbances. Uh, so, in uh, lymphocytic and immunotherapy-induced hypophysitis, inflammatory process predominantly affect uh, corticotropes, followed by gonadotropes and thyrotropes. In pituitary adenomas, corticotropes uh, are usually affected last. So, uh, the basic follow-up is mainly. Uh, done by the initial basic investigations, followed by the anterior pituitary profile. And if the DEI is clinically suspected, we can investigate on that line as well. And uh, special investigations are uh, ordered if the, if the patient is clinically suspected to have a sec obvious secondary cause of uh, hypophysitis. So the MRI features, in 80%, there will be mild to moderate symmetric gland enlargement. And in 30%, there's thickened, non-deviated stalk, which can be isolated. Uh, as we uh, previously discussed, uh, it's infundibular neurohypophysitis. And the contrast uptake is usually intense, uh, homogeneously and less frequently heterogeneous. And uh, enlarged pituitary resembles a pituitary macroadenoma. And there can be a posterior pit a loss of posterior pituitary bright spot uh, due to depletion of vasopressin granules in posterior uh, Hypophysitis. So, uh, these MRI uh, findings uh, are from a young female who presented with headache, visual disturbances, and failure to lactation during her early postpartum uh, period. And it, it illustrates the uh, typical features of hypophysitis uh, where uh, homogeneous enhancement and stalk thickening. And she was started on uh, prednisolone 40 milligram and uh, she, uh, following two months of initiation of treatment, she has drastically improved her radiological uh, 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 features. And uh, after 17 months, she has completely re resolved the features. However, she has to be on uh, hormone replacement uh, uh, throughout. Uh, in some uh, hypophysitis cases, there can be dural inflammation which mimic uh, meningiomas. So uh, in uh, later stages of uh, hypophysitis, uh, the appearance may mimic uh, empty cella syndrome. So this diagram uh, illustrates the initial stage of hypophysitis and later on uh, they ended up with the features suggestive of empty cella syndrome. So, uh, uh, this is a small comparison uh, between the MRI findings of pituitary adenoma and lymphocytic hypophysitis. The gland enlargement is usually asymmetrical in pituitary adenoma, where it's uh, symmetrical in lymphocytic hypophysitis. And uh, the stalk thickening is usually absent in adenomas and usually present in hypophysitis. And uh, the uh, stalk is usually deviated in adenoma and usually central in hypophysitis. And uh, there can be associated cellar uh, association in adenoma and uh, it's uh, rarely seen in uh, hypophysitis. And uh, in uh, gadolin post gadolinium enhancement, uh, it's heterogeneous in adenomas and usually homogeneous in uh, lymphocytic hypophysitis. And the posterior uh, involvement is usually uh, the posterior pituitary signal uh, is usually present in adenoma and usually absent in hypophysitis. So we will move into a few interesting cases. Uh, case number one is a 73-year-old female with a history of ulcerative colitis uh, currently in remission, uh, presented with hyponatremia, weakness, and presyncopal episodes uh, for uh, one year. She noted to have a uh, decreased vision in her right eye. And the laboratory investigations reveal anterior hypopituitism without DI. 
uh, hyponatremia was corrected with hydrocortisone and liver thyroxine, and the pituitary MRI reveals uh, enlarged and heterogeneously enhancing pituitary gland with mild mass effect on the optic chiasm and uh, thickened pituitary stalk. So this is a MRI. So you can appreciate this uh, heterogeneously enhancing mass with uh, stalk thickening. And uh, due to this mass effect, she underwent uh, surgery and uh, they have done uh, several uh, further investigations uh, for microorganisms and other specific investigations. And uh, how ultimately the pathology revealed mixed necrotizing granulomas with giant cells and lymphoblast uh, mastitic infiltrate. So this is basically mixed type necrotizing granulomatous uh, hypophysitis, which is a very rare condition. So the case number two is, 71-year-old male presented with headache and anterior hyperpituitism and DEI. And a pituitary MRI showed heterogeneous uh, supracellar lesion, uh, one centimeter with cystic changes and stalk thickening. So biopsy revealed uh, lymphocytic infiltration uh, pr with presumed uh, lymphocytic uh, hypophysitis diagnosis. So this is his uh, MRI. So this is a uh, heterogeneous uh, lesion with uh, cystic changes with uh, mild cell uh, uh, compression. So ultimately the patient declined uh, high dose glucocorticoid treatment and lost to follow up. And over the uh, following three years, uh, his headache worsens and the lesion has uh, enlarged uh, to uh, one, from one centimeter to two centimeters. And uh, he underwent pituitary surgery and a pathological sample revealed a papillary craniopharyngioma with extensive reactive xanthogranulomatous changes. The patient continued to be pan and but uh, her headaches have completely resolved. So uh, there's no evidence of residual disease at uh, post-operative follow-up. So this uh, rare case demonstrates a spectrum of inflammatory pituitary changes that can occur secondary to other cellular tumors, especially craniopharyngiomas. So the case number three is a 30-year-old female presented with polydipsia and polyuria and ultimately turned out to be a patient with DEI. And she's otherwise healthy and her pituitary MRI only reveals a pituitary stalk thickening of five millimeter. So anterior pituitary function is intact. And she was treated with des desmopressin and she underwent serial MRIs over the next three years and uh, there was no significant uh, change in her follow-up MRIs. And she experienced uh, uh, and underwent spon uh, spontaneous pregnancy and delivery. And uh, two years after the delivery, uh, there was a regression of the thickened stalk. And uh, after 12 years, uh, it was completely uh, resolved. And however, uh, diabetes insipidus persists and the patient continues to take desmopressin. She never developed anterior pituitary involvement and uh, there's only posterior pituitary involvement only. So this is a MRI predominantly uh, showing the stalk thickening and uh, in serial MRIs, it has been completely resolved. So uh, is biopsy always necessary to confirm hypophysitis diagnosis? This is a debatable uh, topic and uh, there's no uh, clear cut established criteria for pituitary biopsy in adults. However, uh, it's an invasive procedure and uh, risk and benefits should be uh, considered before going ahead with biopsy. And it is uh, indicated uh, when the diagnosis is unclear after initial investigations or when the pathology results are needed uh, for definitive treatment. So in pediatric population, a recent UK consensus uh, proposes biopsy in cases of unclear diagnosis after extensive investigations and CSF investigations, uh, or if a stroke thickening is more than 6.5 millimeters, or uh, if there is clinical deterioration. Uh, apart from the basic investigations, whole body CT and FDG PET uh, will be helpful to exclude other secondary causes, as well as CSF analysis uh, for cytology, flow cytometry, and immunochemistry will be further helpful. So how should uh, hypophysitis be treated? This is also a debatable topic. So usually glucocorticoids have been considered the mainstay of treatment for primary hypophysitis uh, as glucocorticoids target the inflammatory process. However, spontaneous resolution of uh, primary infiltration with or without permanent pituitary dysfunction uh, can occur frequently. 
in a German cohort, uh, 46 percent of patients with primary hypophysitis managed uh, just by observation only uh, showed radiological improvement, and one third had hormonal recovery, mainly uh, vasopressin and ACTH. Uh, as no randomized uh, control studies have been performed, it's unclear whether glucocorticoids allowed for better pituitary function recovery versus simple observation. Even a, a broad spectrum of uh, glucocorticoid side defects, risk, risk and benefits should be uh, carefully considered before starting patients on high dose steroids. One milligram per kg per day dosing with slow taper may be preferred to glucocorticoid sorry, pulse therapy to reduce the risk of recurrence. However, recurrence can develop even during the steroid taper. In a series of 76 patients with primary hypophysitis, Almost half uh, of them uh, who received glucocorticoid treatment at some stage with a good initial response, but uh, uh, relapse and treatment failure occurred in 40%. There was no uh, correlation observed between the duration of therapy or initial dose. Sorry, can I just quickly ask, um, you know, when you have to observe these patients, how long do you normally observe them for before you would consider treating? Uh, usually, it's uh, uh, we have to consider long-term treatment in uh, patients with hypophysitis because uh, of this uh, relapse uh, chance of relapse. They have not uh, specifically uh, mentioned the duration of treatment. Uh, I think it's uh, more than two years. They have observed these patients for more than two years, and the patients during the latter stage they were on uh, low dose of uh, tapering dose of steroids. Okay, thank you. Just, just to say, it's Emma here, it's really tricky. Um, so some people respond and sometimes they may relapse. And Florian's got a series, I don't know if Florian's on the call, where he's used other agents um, to try steroid sparing for people who have got um, ongoing symptoms uh, with rituximab. Yeah. Okay. So in the, uh, yeah. in the chronic phase, uh, when irreversible changes have occurred, anti-inflammatory treatment may not affect uh, radiological or hormonal outcome. Uh, clinical signs and uh, symptoms are the main uh, 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 thing we need to consider whether the patient needs to be started on steroids or not. Uh, in patients with mild to moderate headache, with mild pituitary dysfunction without mass effect on optic calcium, uh, can uh, preferably, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, observe them without considering steroids. Low glucocorticoid doses may also be effective. Uh, in a prospective study compared uh, 12 patients treated by uh, 50 milligram of prednisolone for three months with a slow taper versus eight patients managed by observation for two years follow-up. Uh, more prednisolone-treated patients uh, compared to untreated patients improved their pituitary function, and uh, 66 of treated versus 25% of untreated had uh, radiologic improvement. A surgery uh, may be used in decompression of optic calcium or glucocorticoid-resistant cases, or, or to diagnose the diagnosis in cases where uh, it's a uh, need uh, for the clarification. Uh, in a large series of 60 patients with primary hypophysitis, patients who underwent surgery had a worse outcome based on symptoms and uh, final endocrine dysfunction. However, uh, that uh, those patients who underwent surgery had more severe baseline disease. So radiotherapy is another option. Uh, fractionated radiotherapy and stereotactic radiotherapy have been used uh, successfully in few patients requiring multimodal therapy. Uh, for uh, treatment resistant and recurrent uh, hypocytis, radio surgery is an option to allow mass control and discontinuation of immunosuppression. Uh, so the surveillance is uh, usually done by repeat MRI at uh, three to six months. And uh, the, this imaging interval can be prolonged if the disease resolution is favorable. However, if the lesions are causing significant mass effect at baseline or follow-up, either glucocorticoid treatment, biopsy, or both should be performed. So uh, during observation, periodic re-evaluation for the pituitary function uh, also should be done. So this uh, summarizes uh, the studies on uh, this hypophysitis. You can appreciate that these are 
studies done by a small number of patients and almost uh, all the studies there was uh, a uh, prominent female population and their mean age was between uh, third and fourth decade. And uh, their presentation uh, varied with, between uh, headache, uh, diplopia or combination. So in uh, observation group, uh, there's uh, more radiological improvement rather than the hormonal improvement. And in glucocorticoid uh, management group, they have used various uh, glucocorticoid regimes. And in those studies also, which I have highlighted in this gray, uh, green color squares, uh, they show more radiological improvement than the hormonal improvement. However, some studies show uh, more hormonal improvement than the radiological improvement. And in some studies, they have uh, equal hormonal and radiological improvement. So in conclusion, hypophysitis is defined as inflammation of the pituitary gland that is primary or secondary to a local or systemic process. And primary hypophysitis has variable glucocorticoid response rate from 20 to more than 95% in a partial or complete hormonal and radiographic response. Overall improvement in endocrine function occurs less than reduction in pituitary mass. Earlier glucocorticoid initiation has been shown to improve hormonal recovery. And interestingly, some ret retrospective studies have revealed better pituitary function outcomes with observation versus glucocorticoid administration. However, milder and potentially reversible cases were preferably less likely to be uh, treated with glucocorticoids. Studied prednisolone doses for treatment of primary hypophysitis range widely between 20 mg per day initial dose to 1 mg methylprednisolone pulse therapy. Due to the rarity of this condition and a lack of large randomized uh, prospective clinical trial, the exact dose, duration, and even indication for glucocorticoids uh, is still a matter of debate. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Namani. Uh, has anyone got any questions? I mean, people are trying to use other agents as steroid sparing, as um, I mentioned yes. earlier. Did you, did you, was that discussed in this uh, review? Yes, they have discussed about uh, methyl, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, they have discussed about uh, this immunosuppression with retoximab, acetylprene uh, and methotrexate. And the most uh, studied agent was acetylprene. And however, uh, there was only a uh, predominant mass reduction rather than the hormonal improvement with acetylprene. And they have further discussed about the uh, rituximab, uh, which is an anti-CD20. And it can be used uh, predominantly uh, B lymphocyte predominant disease as well as uh, relapsing IgG4 related disease. And uh, they have uh, observed complete remission in those conditions. Thank you. Yes, that's that's um, definitely, um, um, as I said, Dr. Furness had some experience uh, using that here. Any thoughts or questions from anyone? Sorry, we had a computer challenge at the beginning. Really sorry for your time. I don't think I can see anything on the chat, is there? No, there isn't. Um, thank you so much, Namani, that was great. Um, I guess my only question is, um, if you were to observe these patients, let's say, I don't know, for a month or two months, and mm -hmm. then you were to start steroids, would you still get the same effect as starting steroids straight away? Uh, yes, uh, that's a actually interesting question because uh, they uh, have suggested that we should start the patients on uh, steroids as soon as possible because with the time they will uh, end up with uh, other complications like uh, empty cell syndrome or other uh, findings. So actually they have uh, illustrated a nice diagram. I think there was some, yeah, sorry. Yeah, they are, uh, this is the diagram they have finally uh, mentioned regarding this uh, management algorithm. So uh, 
if the mild phases are observed for uh, some periods and if they have uh, get they are getting wor worsening of their symptoms or any uh, kind of uh, mri features uh, they were started on steroids but they have never commented whether it's uh, uh, truly helpful or not for those patients because uh, I think they have not uh, studied those population who were started on steroids later. Yeah. No, that, um, yeah, I guess that would be quite interesting to, to know because then I yeah, guess I if you want to observe patients, I don't know. The thing is they've often got headaches and symptoms. So you'd probably be starting treatment on the symptomatic patients. You might be observing someone if they didn't have symptoms that the nature of the presentation would be that they were probably feeling unwell. Yes, the symptomatic patients with uh, visual disturbances and uh, uh, MRI, uh, this optic chiasmal compression, they, they were the main patients who were started on steroids during the initial stage. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Namani. Well done, that's very interesting.